Let's go. We must walk south until the spirit of the waterhole shows itself. We walked for perhaps half an hour. The terrain changed abruptly and we came to a barren area. There was a large round hill where the chaparral had burnt. It looked like a bald head. We walked toward it. I thought that Don Juan was going to climb the mild slope, but he stopped instead and remained in a very attentive position. His body seemed to tense as a single unit and shivered for an instant. Then he relaxed again and stood limply. I could not figure out how his body could remain erect while his muscles were so relaxed. At that moment, a very strong gust of wind jolted me. Don Juan's body turned in the direction of the wind, toward the west. He did not use his muscles to turn, or at least he didn't use them the way I would use mine to turn. Don Juan's body rather seemed to have been pulled from the outside. It was as if someone else had arranged his body to face a new direction. I kept on staring at him. He looked at me from the corner of his eye. The expression on his face was one of determination, purpose. All of his being was attentive, and I stared at him in wonder. I had never been in any situation that called for such a strange concentration. Suddenly his body shivered as though he had been splashed by a sudden shower of cold water. He had another jolt and he started to walk as if nothing happened. I followed him. We flanked the naked hills on the east side until we came to the middle part of it. He stopped there, turning to face the west. From where we stood, the top of the hill was not so round and smooth as it seemed to be from the distance. There was a cave or a hole near the top. I looked at it fixedly because Don Juan was doing the same. Another strong gust of wind sent a chill up my spine. Don Juan turned toward the south and scanned the area with his eyes. There, he said in a whisper and pointed to an object on the ground. I strained my eyes to see. There was something on the ground perhaps twenty feet away. It was light brown and as I looked at it, it shivered. I focused all my attention on it. The object was almost round and seemed to be curled. In fact, it looked like a curled up dog. What is it? I whispered to Don Juan. I don't know. He whispered back and peered at the object. What's it look like to you? I told him it seemed to be a dog. Too large for a dog, he said matter-of-factly. I took a couple steps toward it, but Don Juan stopped me gently. I stared at it again. It was definitely some sort of animal and was either asleep or dead. I could almost see its head. Its ears protruded like the ears of a wolf. By then, I was definitely sure it was a curled-up animal. I thought it could have been a brown calf. I whispered that to Don Juan. He answered it was too compact to be a calf. Besides, its ears were pointed. The animal shivered again, and then I noticed that it was alive. I could actually see it was breathing, yet it didn't seem to breathe rhythmically. The breaths it took were more like irregular shivers. I had a sudden realization at that moment. It's an animal that's dying. You're right, but what kind of animal is it? I couldn't make out specific features. Don Juan took a couple cautious steps toward it. I followed him. It was quite dark by then, and we had to take two more steps in order to keep the animal in view. Watch out. If it's a dying animal, it might leap on us with its last strength. The animal, whatever it was, seemed to be on its last legs. Its breathing was irregular. Its body shook spasmically, but it didn't change its curled up position. At a given moment, however, a tremendous spasm actually lifted the animal off the ground. I heard an inhuman shriek and the animal stretched out its legs. Its claws were more than frightening, they were nauseating. The animal tumbled on its side after stretching its legs and then rolled on its back. I heard a formidable growl and Don Juan's voice shouting, Run for your life! And that was exactly what I did. I scrambled toward the top of the hill with unbelievable speed and agility. When I was halfway to the top, I looked back and I saw Don Juan standing in the same place. He signaled me to come down. I ran down the hill. What happened? I asked, completely out of breath. I think the animal's dead. We advanced cautiously toward the animal. It was sprawled on its back. As I came closer to it, I nearly yelled with fright. I realized it was not quite dead yet. Its body was still trembling. Its legs, which were sticking up in the air, shook wildly. The animal is definitely in its last gasps. I walked in front of Don Juan. A new jolt moved the animal's body and I could see its head. I turned to Don Juan, horrified. Judging by the animal, it was obviously a mammal, yet it had a beak like a bird. I stared at it in complete and absolute horror. My mind refused to believe it. I was dumbfounded. I couldn't even articulate a word. Never in my whole existence had I witnessed anything of that nature. 
Something inconceivable was there, right in front of my very eyes. I wanted Don Juan to explain that incredible animal, but I could only mumble to him. He was staring at me. I glanced at him and glanced at the animal, and then something in me arranged the world, and I knew at once what the animal was. I walked over to it and picked it up. It was a large branch of a bush. It had been burnt, and possibly the wind had blown some burnt debris which got caught in the dry branch, and thus gave the appearance of a large, bulging, round animal. The color of the burnt debris made it look light brown in contrast with the green vegetation. I laughed at my idiocy and excitedly explained to Don Juan that the wind blowing through it had made it look like a live animal. I thought he'd be pleased with the way I had resolved the mystery, but he turned around and began walking to the top of the hill. I followed him. He crawled inside a depression that looked like a cave. It was not a hole, but a shallow dent in the sandstone. What you've done is no triumph. You wasted a beautiful power, a power that blew life into that dry twig. He said that a real triumph would have been for me to let go and follow the power until the world had ceased to exist. He didn't seem to be angry with me or disappointed with my performance. He repeatedly stated that this was only the beginning and it took time to handle power. I felt embarrassed. I began to apologize for my tendencies of always being sure of my ways. It doesn't matter. That branch was a real animal, and it was really alive at the moment power touched it, since what kept it alive was power. The trick was, like in dreaming, to sustain the sight of it. See what I mean? I wanted to ask him something else, but he hushed me up and said that I should remain completely silent but awake all night, and that he alone was going to talk for a while. I wanted to ask him something else, but he hushed me up and said I should remain completely silent but awake all night and that he alone was going to talk for a while. He said that the spirit, which knew his voice, might become subdued with the sound of it and leave us alone. He explained that the idea of making oneself accessible to power had serious overtones. Power was a devastating force that could easily lead to one's death and had to be treated with great care. Becoming available to power had to be done systematically, but always with great caution. It involved making one's presence obvious by a contained display of loud talk or by any other type of noisy activity, and then it was mandatory to observe a prolonged and total silence. A controlled outburst and a controlled quietness were the mark of a warrior. He said that I should have sustained the sight of the live monster for a while longer, in a controlled fashion without losing my mind or becoming deranged with excitation or fear. I should have striven to stop the world. He pointed out that after I run up the hill for my dear life, I was in a perfect state for stopping the world. Combined in that state were fear, awe, power, and death. He said that such a state would be pretty hard to repeat. I whispered in his ear, What do you mean by stopping the world? He gave me a ferocious look, before he answered that it was a technique practiced by those who were hunting for power, a technique by virtue of which the world as we know it was made to collapse.